For the last several weeks, we have been considering what it means to be a Christian soldier. We looked at the times in the New Testament two weeks ago when uh, in the New Testament where we are referred to as Christian soldiers and that there is a war to fight, but it's not against flesh and blood. It's against evil, it's against sin, and that influence that it has on, our, on us and on our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones, making sure we're always standing for the truth. Last week, we talked a little bit about the fiery arrows of the wicked one, and we noted a couple, at least, of uh, examples and moments in our daily lives where we come into contact or we are, are shot at, I guess is a better way to put it, with these fiery arrows of the sinful influence that Satan is trying to get at us with. And we noted how that Paul says in Ephesians 6 that with the shield of faith, we are able to quench the fiery dart or the fiery arrows of the wicked one. This morning, I'd like to consider what Paul says in Ephesians 6 and in verse 18, as he's addressing the final piece of equipment that the Christian has been given by God. And even though it's not given an analogous physical piece of armor, as like with the breastplate of righteousness or the sword of the spirit, it is just as much and just as important a piece of equipment as anything else mentioned in Ephesians 6. We find in verse 17, Paul says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then he says in verse 18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Paul explains that the final piece of equipment that God has blessed us with is prayer. And what Paul says in regard to prayer, he says, praying always. Now this term always means to be constant continual. Not that we're praying literally 24 hours a day, but that we are constantly being given to prayer. But we are not forgetting to pray to God. And so when he says praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, prayer is speaking to God. Okay. Often, in fact, there are times where it's, it's specifically referencing praise in our prayer to God. Whereas supplication means to make a request, to offer a petition. And certainly in our prayers, we do often do both. We praise God, we acknowledge, acknowledge him as our creator. We acknowledge him as being the one with all power and all authority. And we often also make our petitions, I, whether it's for ourselves or a loved one or a friend in our context, Paul brings up here in verse 18 that he, they be praying for all the saints. And then he goes on to say in verses 19 and 20, praying for him, Paul, also. That despite the persecution he was facing, despite being thrown in prison, that he would continue to preach boldly the word of God. Even Paul, the apostle, asked for prayers for strength. And it's important for us to understand that given how important this piece of equipment is, it's the last one that Paul lists, we need to make sure that we understand what characteristics are necessary when we pray. Because when Paul says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, being watchful, we want to understand what all characteristics go into this. And so there are five that I want to consider with you this morning that will help us. And when we pray to God, whatever the reason is, whether we're praying for our food or we're praying because of some stressor that we have at work or at school, or maybe we're praying for a loved one. Maybe we're praying because of some physical malady or some emotional situation, or maybe it's a spiritual issue. These five characteristics, making sure we pay attention to these, will help our prayers be the type of prayers that God wants us to offer to him. The first one we want to consider is making sure that we have faith when we pray. First and foremost, obviously it doesn't make sense to pray to God if you don't believe in God. But it's not just belief that we're talking about when we say faith. Because the term faith in the New Testament 
is a term that literally means persuasion or conviction. The Hebrew writer, for instance, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, tells the brethren, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Notice the Hebrew writer describes what faith is. It's not just belief. You have to believe that he is, that he exists, and that he is all God. He's all powerful. He's God. But that he's also a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, meaning he's capable of fulfilling his promises. I am convicted and persuaded that what God says he will do. And because I'm convicted and because I'm persuaded, I'm going to please him. I'm going to do those things he tells me to do. But in James chapter 1, James recognizes the need for the conviction and persuasion, not only generally in describing our faith in God, is his existence, and the fact that he's capable of doing what he says, but even to the specific of actually fulfilling the prayers that we ask of him. In James chapter 1, starting in verse 5, James says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. Notice James describes a scenario in which a person prays to God, but they're not convicted or persuaded in their request. In particular, what's being referenced here is wisdom. I think even more broadly, those spiritual uh, prayer, spiritual requests we make regarding growth and knowledge and, and helping us to understand God's word, those things God will help us in. And wisdom is one of those things that James says God gives to all men liberally. Now, how he brings about that wisdom in us may not be what we have in mind, but God certainly will bring that about. But then in verse 6, he says, but let, not him, or, but let him ask in conviction, in persuasion, not doubting. Notice the contrast here. Because we're not doubting God's existence in this scenario, but we're doubting either God's willingness or his ability to actually give me what I'm asking. That's what's being doubted here or in, this, in the hypothetical scenario of not doubting. So when, the, when, the, when James says, he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind, he's not, he doesn't have any foundation. He doesn't have any anchor. And so everything that comes along is going to, he's wish what we might say he's wish washing he easily influenced because he's not set. He's not grounded in God's word and he's not grounded in that conviction that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. When we pray, we must be convicted and persuaded that God exists, that God is capable of doing what he promises he's going to do, and that when we ask him, particularly for spiritual things. We're not talking about physical things per se. We're talking about spiritual things that help us to be pleasing to God. God will, one way or another, bring that about. Now, sometimes we say, be careful what you ask for or wish for. Sometimes when we ask for patience, what are we given? We're given four kids. That's what we're given. So sometimes God's fulfillment of your prayer might not be what you're expecting or in the moment want. However, it will produce patience or it'll break you one way or the other. But God will give you the means by which you can grow, the means by which you can learn and mature as a Christian. And God will always answer yes to those requests. The next one we want to consider is wholeheartedness. And this is different from conviction or persuasion because wholeheartedness means full devotion and love, fully committed. I'm all in. That's what wholeheartedly means. When we consider passages like Psalm 119 in verse 145, the psalmist says, I cry out with my whole heart. 
Hear me, O Lord, I will keep your statutes. In fact, throughout Psalm 119, our psalmist is praising the law of God. He's acknowledging his need and his desire to learn more about God's word. And in doing so, he says, I cry out with my whole heart. All of me, my full devotion, my full commitment is to you and to your word. In Jeremiah chapter 29 and in verse 10, God speaks about what he's going to accomplish, what he's going to do when he brings the children of Israel back from captivity in Babylon. At that, at that point, you call them children of Israel. It's, it's, it was Judah who was taken away by Babylon, but it's Israel because that's all that was left. For thus says the Lord, verse 10, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. Talking about Jerusalem. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Notice God and his, his acknowledgement that he's going to be taking, he's punishing his people. Judah was being punished. They're taken away into captivity, but it's not going to stay that way. God is going to make it come about where they're going to be able to come back to Jerusalem, come back to the temple. And God says, when you pray to me, I will listen to you. And when you seek me or search for me, you will find me. But this is all contingent upon us searching or Judah, Israel, searching for him with all their heart. Their full commitment, their full love and devotion. And remember what Jesus says were the first and second greatest commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. And the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, it's not saying all your heart and all your might and so forth for no reason. That's, descriptive, that's describing this wholeheartedness. Full commitment, full devotion that is being described there. And here when God gives this promise, he says, I will hear your prayers. You will find me, but you have to be fully committed to me. That's the condition. When we pray, we must have conviction and persuasion. And we must be fully and wholly committed to him. If we're not, why are, we, why are we praying to him? I mean, we can pray to him, Lord, help me to be fully committed to you. And certainly we need to do that and make sure we're being fully committed. But in terms of full devotion and full love, we must give all of ourselves to him. We can't hold anything back. In Philippians chapter 4 and in verse 6, you know, it's interesting when you do a word search, for instance, of prayer or praying and thankfulness. There is a host of scriptures that pop up from the Old to New Testaments where prayer and thankfulness are used hand in hand. And there's a reason for that. In fact, in Philippians chapter 4 and in verse 6, Paul says, Be anxious for nothing. Some translations have, Do not worry. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Notice we have by prayer, there is your praise of God, your acknowledgement of Him. There's your supplication. You're drawing up a petition. You're offering this petition to the Lord with thanksgiving. It's important to note that thanksgiving be a part of our prayer. In fact, I would suggest no matter what the purpose or the, uh, the main topic of our prayer may be, that it always have thanksgiving included. Perhaps the very first thing we say after we, addressed our, uh, after we address our God is thank you for all your blessings. Because there's a reason why thankfulness is included in many discussions of prayer. And it's because when we begin to think about the blessings God has given us, particularly 
when we're praying to God and we're, we have something on our mind we're asking God about or we're worried about something, when we start going through thinking about all the things we're thankful for, there are many times it may come that at the end or by the time we're, we're ready to ask our, make our request, we realize it's really not that big a deal. In the broad scheme of things, God has blessed me so much. That thing that bothered me when I started my prayer, you know what? I, I don't, may not even need to, maybe I don't need a whole lot of help. I mean, in terms of, oh, maybe this isn't as big a deal as I thought it was. That God, all I really need, the only assistance I really need is simply to be reminded of what you've done for me already. And that's what prayer can do for us is it encourages us, it edifies us by reminding ourselves that this is what God has already done. You think he won't be there for you for the rest of it? And so certainly being thankful, having that, recognizing what God has done, being gracious, having gratitude towards him is essential in our prayers. In Colossians chapter 4 and in verse 1, or starting in verse 2, Colossians 4 and in verse 2 Paul says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Similar to what he tells the Ephesians about praying always and be watchful in prayer. But what he says is continue earnestly in prayer. That means it's a priority. But then he says, being vigilant in praying with thanksgiving. So that when you do pray, because prayer is a priority... You make sure that when you pray, you are thanking God through the, in the course of your prayer. You're acknowledging him. And certainly thanksgiving is a, a type of praise of God. We're acknowledging his power and what he's done for us. But that has to be a part of our prayers. No matter what it is we're praying for, we need to be thanking him always for what he's already done for us and what he's promised to do for us, particularly spiritually, for our uh, hope of heaven. The next one we want to consider is particular to when we have made a mistake, when we've messed up, when we've sinned, but it certainly has an element of even more broadly as well, recognizing our state, recognizing who and what we are compared to Jehovah. And that has to do with contrition or having a contrite heart. Means having sincere remorse, sincere penitent heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and in verse 10, Paul refers to his previous letter to them, wherein he was fairly harsh and had to correct them in a lot of ways. And Paul says, and look at how it changed you. Look at, look at how you have, have repented. You've turned from those things. And he says in verse 10, godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. See, godly sorrow speaks, remember what godliness is. Godliness is my desire to please God. So godly sorrow is the fact that I have failed to please God. I feel sorrow because I have not done what is, I claim is my goal, which is to please him. Therefore, godly sorrow produces repentance. Why? Because I want to please him. I don't want to do those things that don't please him anymore. So I'm going to change. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and in verse 13. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and in verse 13. Notice how that God, after the temple is... Uh, dedicated after Solomon has built the temple and God is going to describe these times when maybe the children of Israel have done wrong. And in verse 13, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain or I command the locusts to devour the land or I send pestilence among my people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Verse 15, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. God says that when there are times that my people have stumbled, 
Notice God doesn't say, if I shut up heaven and there is no rain. This is when. When my people stumble, if, verse 14, my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, they turn from the things that they've done wrong, I will take care of them. I will forgive their sin. I will heal, take away whatever punishment had been given to them. I'll take care of them. But it was contingent upon them humbling themselves, those with a contrite heart, and making sure they turn away from the sin. In Isaiah chapter 57 and in verse 15, Isaiah 57 and in verse 15, God says, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. Here's what Jehovah says. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. There's a passage that is quoted in the New Testament in 2 Peter chapter 4, and Paul quotes it as well, but Peter does in 2 Peter chapter 4, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Well, the humble, uh, it's associated with a contrite heart, one that recognizes what our state is. And even if we haven't necessarily committed a sin, and that's why we're praying to God, we are still to be humble. We are still to have a contrite heart in the sense of that sincerity and acknowledgement that I have never been perfect. <laughs> Jesus had always been perfect. But I recognize my state compared to Jehovah and that it's only by his mercy and his grace that I have any hope of salvation. That's part of what a contrite heart acknowledges. In Isaiah 66 and in verse 1, God says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest for all those things my hand has made. And all those things exist. Why? Because God made them. Says the Lord. But on this one will I look. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit. Who trembles at my word. Now I want to focus on that very last part that God issues here. Who is, who's the one that God will look upon? And, and by this, he means the one he's going to take notice of. The one who has a poor and contrite spirit who trembles at the word of God. Well, obviously, if somebody's trembling, it's because they are afraid. They have fear. Solomon teaches us that fear is the beginning of wisdom. Because if I have a healthy dose, in fact, throughout the New Testament, we've talked before about the fear of God, that the term most often used is phobos, where we get our English word phobia from. That's fear. That's being afraid. We have examples of people trembling in both the Old and New Testaments because of the power of God. Recognizing that that fear is a good thing. We have to remember what God is capable of doing. That with a, just with the thought of his mind, snap of his finger, a single word from his mouth, the heavens and the earth were created. All he had to say was, let there be light. In fact, uh, one of our daily devotionals last week, we talked about the power of the voice of Yahweh. Well, Jehovah is greatly to be feared among the congregation of the saints. Jehovah must be revered. Fear and reverence are not the same thing, though. Fear and respect are not the same thing. Because I have fear, I therefore hold in reverence or respect. See, the fear produces the respect. It acknowledges the power of God. And in our prayers... Yes, we most definitely must be remorseful and penitent when we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
but in our prayers, even when we're not asking for some particular sin, forgiveness for some sin we've committed, we still must have a contrite heart. One that acknowledges that God is our creator and that he is the one who takes care of us and sustains us. And without him, we're nothing. The last one I want to consider with you comes from James chapter 5 and in verse 16. James 5 and in verse 16, in a context of spiritual matters and spiritual issues, James says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The very next verse, verse 17, he talks about Elijah. And how that in that situation, Elijah prayed for rain. He prayed that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed, and it rained. Well, that's a physical situation. How much more so, really, is James's point here, will God then acknowledge spiritual requests? But what he says in verse 16, James says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man or a righteous person. Consider the opposite. Consider the, the, the antithesis to what he says. The sluggish, lazy, inattentive prayer of an unrighteous person avails nothing. Now, I want you to think about, first of all, the effective, fervent part. The terms here are really interesting. We're talking about an energet energy, is the term energy is used here. Fervent, sometimes this means boiling or hot. Enthusiastic, sometimes. But it doesn't mean externally or physically effective or being, you know, having hand gestures and having inflection and so forth. That's not the type of prayer that James is referring to. It's that of the spirit. That the Spirit is fully engaged in praying when we pray. That we are fully focused in our prayer to God. And that when we pray, we're praying from a proper state. But what's interesting about this is, without any of the other four characteristics, we cannot pray to God in a proper state. We can't offer an effective, fervent prayer of a righteous person if we're not in a righteous state. If we're not praying from full conviction and faith. If we're not praying from full devotion or wholeheartedness. If we're not being thankful and gracious in our words to God and in our heart to Him. If we're not contrite or have a spirit of humility in our prayer to Him. We cannot have an effective and fervent prayer that avails much if we're not praying in a proper state before God. And so what this is about is making sure that when we go back to Ephesians 6 and verse 18, that we pray always with all prayer and supplication and the Spirit being watchful to this end, that we do so from a pure, righteous state before God. Because I want my prayer to avail much. The only way that's going to happen is if I'm being effective and fervent in my spirit to the Lord. And I'm praying to him from a proper state before him. In 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 22. John says, whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now, John's not speaking literally of whatever we ask. Okay? Obviously, there are limits. In fact, next week, we're going to talk about the content of our prayers. Okay? What can we just ask for a million bucks and expect God to give us a million bucks? Okay, we're going to talk more about that next week. But what John says is that as it pertains especially to those spiritual things and spiritual pursuits of being righteous and holy before God, whatever we ask, we will receive from him, including forgiveness of sins, 1 John 1, verse 9. Because we keep his commandments, we do what he tells us, 
that are, and we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. There's your godliness again. God hears and listens and answers the prayers of individuals who are praying from a proper state. Now, I hesitated to say saved state in so much that it is important to note that God hears everyone. Okay, It's important to note that God hears all people, no matter what kind of state they're in doesn't necessarily mean he's going to answer those prayers. One of the benefits of being a child of God is having access to prayer that we can be convicted and persuaded he will answer. It may be yes, it may be no, it may be yeah, but later, it may be yeah, but not at all in the way you're thinking, but he absolutely will answer. Another example would be Cornelius. The centurion. He offered up prayers and alms to God, or uh, he offered up prayers to God. He offered alms to the people in his community. And one of the things that the angel said when they came to him, it says, your prayers and alms have come up as a memorial before God. God had heard the prayers of Cornelius, but there was a problem. Cornelius was not in a saved state. And I would say that Cornelius wasn't a righteous man either. He was devout. But at no time was he called righteous because righteous says that this person is in a proper state before God. Now, again, going back to Ephesians 6 and verse 18, Paul says to pray always with all praise to God, with all petition, supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end. Are we being watchful in our prayers, in our praying, in our prayer life, I guess you could say? Are we being vigilant? Are we praying always? We've been talking about the soldier of Christ, and we talked about the armor. We've talked about having well, what those terms mean in terms of weapons of our warfare. We've talked about the, the fiery darts of the wicked one. And I saw this, I thought this was pretty neat. So is this how it looks when we pray and there's people gathered around and their heads are bowed and they're praying together, how we feel when we pray. And I think that's a screenshot of 300 or something like that. And it's a bunch of soldiers in line. I saw that and I thought, you know what, that's, that's really good. It's the idea that when we pray, we are humble and we are contrite and we recognize what God has done. But when we pray, what does Paul tell us in Philippians 4 verse 7? And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When we pray, that gives us that, that connection to the Father in a, in a, I guess you could say, not necessarily verbally, but in a very real way, we're speaking to Jehovah. We're talking to him. And whatever our cares or our concerns are, we're now giving to him, leaving us unburdened and able to focus completely on the task at hand, which is being a soldier of Christ. So when we pray, remember that you are using one of the pieces of equipment that we're given as a Christian soldier Every time you pray, you are wielding that particular piece of equipment. You are utilizing what God has given you to help you be a faithful servant, a faithful warrior, faithful soldier of Christ. So, the question for us this morning is, are we being constant, being awake, in fact, this term being watchful, it means to not be asleep, to be awakened and alert. Be, are we awake in praying? Are we being constant? Are we being vigilant? Because just as much, just as important as the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, just as important as those are, just as important as the shield of faith is.
prayer is every bit as important. Let's make sure in our life today and going forward that we're praying to God consistently. That we're not going days or weeks without talking to God. Without praying to Him. Without asking forgiveness for our sins. Without acknowledging the food that He gives us. Let's make sure we're praying to Him always. We offer an invitation this morning to those who are not Christians. To become a Christian this morning. To take up the armor of the Christian. To be equipped to be able to face all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Those of us who are Christians... Just like we talked about in our first lesson with Huey, Dewey, and Louie, what happens if we don't have our armor on right? What happens if we completely leave our armor behind? Well, just as silly as it would be to see a, a soldier going out to battle, but he left his sword in the, in the bunker, how silly would it be for us to go out into the world and leave our praying at home? Take your equipment with you always. If you're subject, if you need help in any way, in any way, come forward as we stand and sing.